Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I am both honored and delighted to introduce our esteemed speaker today. But first, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the events in Ukraine. Many of us are watching Russia's invasion with compassion and with heartbreak. And although he's made his home in Canada for many years, Dr. Siegel was born in Ukraine. So on behalf of USC and the Center for Mindfulness Science, I'd like to express our wishes for the safety and well-being of all the people of Ukraine. Dr. Siegel is Distinguished Professor of Psychology and Mood Disorders at the University of Toronto Scarborough, an award-winning clinical psychologist and continuously funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health. His program of research characterized psychological markers of relapse vulnerability and affective disorder, which in turn provided empirical rationale for offering training in mindfulness meditation to currently depressed patients in recovery. An author of over 10 books and 180 scientific publications, including The Mindful Way Through Depression, A Patient Guide for Achieving Mood Balance in Everyday Life, Dr. Siegel continues to advocate for the relevance of mindfulness-based clinical care in psychiatry and mental health. I'd like to add a personal note, since Zindel was too modest to note in his bio sketch that he, along with Mark Williams and John Teasdale, are the developers of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And exactly 20 years ago, when I was a graduate student, I practically got down on my hands and knees to plead for an invitation <laughs> to attend a seven-day residential training in Orangeville, Ontario which happened to be the first mindfulness-based cognitive therapy training. MBCT has been the primary influence in my own work, and I am deeply grateful that Zindel has offered his wise guidance to me ever th since then. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Zindel Siegel. Thank you, Randy. Um, for a couple of things, uh, first of all, the war in Ukraine is in a background of all of the activities, academic and personal that we do. And I think it's an important acknowledgement as we continue to do what we do, that there is a sort of turbulence that we're trying to live with and hope for positive outcomes. And um, thank you as well for insisting that you come to that first MBCT training. It was chaotic and divisive and at the same time brought forth a lot of people just like you who've been able to establish mindfulness and evidence-based practices for people dealing with depression, anxiety, and a whole host of other personal difficulties. So it's really nice to come full circle back to your center and, and to give this talk, which I'm hoping will be a little bit of an update and also a little bit of a look into the future in terms of what we understand about some of the mechanisms and the way that we teach mindfulness to our clinical uh, cohorts. So I'm going to share my screen and um, sort of get started here. Um, are you able to see my screen? The slides? Yes. OK, great. And I know that a lot of the things that I'll be saying have um, a lot of room for discussion, but from what I understand, we'll have ample time for discussion as we, uh, as we move into my talk. So just a moment to, to list some disclosures related to my being the developer of NBCT, receive royalties from Guilford Press, also present at conferences and keynotes where I receive a fee. Now, I think it's pretty common in the meditation world for people to start speaking about um, their entry into meditation from an earlier time in their lives, perhaps. Uh, but my entry into this work actually did not come from a trajectory in which um, I interacted with a lot of people who were doing meditation. Actually, my entry into this work came from a very large NIMH study that was funded at, at the time to examine the uh, outcomes of um, antidepressant pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy. 
And at the time, I think it was a $10 million grant for three sites, Pittsburgh, uh, Washington, and Toronto, to compare imipramine to interpersonal psychotherapy and to cognitive therapy. And the idea really was, are psychotherapies as effective as antidepressants in addressing depression? Now, I don't know uh, if many of you recall, but indeed, the, um, the culture at the time, the, the, the prevalent views at the time were somewhat um, focused on biological versus psychological approaches to depression. And so this study was seen as a harbinger of uh, trying to resolve that debate. And the findings of the study, uh, initially the acute phase treatment results were published in the front page of the New York Times. And the article and the headline was, psychotherapy is as good as drug in curing depression. And so what that did was, I think, legitimize and establish um, a landing strip for psychotherapies to start being part of the conversation, not just in terms of acute phase treatments, but also in terms of maintenance treatments. And as increasing um, epidemiological data about depression was being collected, it became clear that depression is a disorder that has a number of different phases that require treatment. The Treatment of Depression Collaborative Project that I mentioned um, focused primarily on acute phase outcomes. Can we help people who have developed um, impaired functionality due to depressive symptoms recover sufficiently to enter a phase of remission and even if that remission is sustained to move into recovery. And most of the work of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and I would even venture to say mindfulness-based interventions are really focusing on this phase of the treatment of depression, helping people develop maintenance strategies for continuing to extend the gains of acute phase treatment. So one of the things that I think was surprising when we developed MBCT is our insistence that MBCT really not be used or seen as a um, legitimate uh, replacement for first-line acute phase psychotherapies for depression. Um, the data really aren't there, even though it might be that elements of MBCT are used. Our focus primarily was in psychological prophylaxis of remission. Uh, psychological prophylaxis of relapse and enhanced remission and enhanced recovery. Now, mindfulness really wasn't part of the discussion at that point. The early data suggesting that psychological therapies might play a role in psychological prophylaxis of relapse came from studies that examined that question, looking at formats of psychotherapies that were modified to be able to be provided to people over the long term. So if you just think about it broadly, during acute phase psychotherapy, patients go to a therapist once a week. And uh, in the Treatment of Depression Collaborative trial, it was 16 weeks of either IPT or CBT, um, and also weekly medication visits uh, with a psychiatrist or a physician to monitor their medication. Um, and then if you think about maintenance formats of psychotherapy, these have typically uh, titrated the rates of contact to once a month. So some early data from um, the use of psychotherapies to prevent relapse comes from a study by Evans, which looked at cognitive therapy, cognitive therapy combined with antidepressant medication, uh, drug alone, and a drug with no continuation. So essentially ending the medication at the point of remission versus continuing it for a year. And if you look at the outcomes, you can see that people who get better on an antidepressant and then stop the antidepressant have very poor outcomes over a year, 50% of them relapse. If you provide um, the medication to get them well, and if you keep them well by providing the medication over the full year, they do significantly better. But people who received cognitive therapy do equally well. And there's some gain for people who receive cognitive therapy and the medication, 
But because these sample sizes are so small, there's no statistical power to really test uh, whether this is a significant increment in, in protection and prophylaxis. Another study, which I think showed this even more clearly, was a very large study done by Ellen Frank and her group evaluating imipramine against uh, interpersonal psychotherapy. And so here, patients were all treated to remission. And then at the point of remission, they were followed and treated for three more years. And what you find is that the best outcomes are for the people who received imipramine, continued to take imipramine over the three-year follow-up. But what's interesting is that people who, who received imipramine and then were switched to interpersonal psychotherapy had significantly better outcomes than people who were switched to imipramine and were given a pill placebo. Here's another piece of evidence that suggests there are things that patients learn in psychotherapy that can allow them to become their own therapist over the follow-up. And if we could harness what those things are and teach them in a way that was effective and um, scalable, then we might be able to make an impact on the high rates of relapse and chronicity that often characterize mood disorders. And so this is really where, I guess, myself, Mark, and John um, come into this story. Ellen Frank had some money from the MacArthur Foundation and funded me to develop a maintenance version of interpersonal, uh, a maintenance version of mindfulness, of I'm getting ahead of myself, a maintenance version of cognitive therapy. Ellen in this study used the maintenance version of IPT, which had sessions with patients every month and a format that made it relevant to people who were um, only coming once a month in terms of the content and agendas that were addressed. The um, work that she asked me to do was, could you do something, could I do something similar for cognitive therapy? And um, in a way, I could have. I, I, I could have met with Mark and John and just said, well, look, this is what cognitive therapy looks like over 16 weeks. Um, can we stretch it out to once a month, follow what Ellen has done, and um, we would have our maintenance version of CBT. But we actually took a different tack. I, I think what we felt was that it would be more efficient if we could actually identify some of the mechanisms that were conferring vulnerability to people who relapsed. If we could identify them, and if we could wrap a therapy around them, we might give people a chance to address these vulnerability factors directly. I think if you fast forward you know, to NIH and the, uh, the RDoC framework, this would be languaged, if you will, as a target identification, target engagement and target validation. We were interested not so much in developing a therapy, we were interested in finding what the, the vulnerability targets were and then finding out how to address them. And so a lot of our discussions in trying to come up with a maintenance version of CBT really had to do with what we felt were the best predictors of relapse at the time. And, and the evidence at that time in terms of psychological predictors of relapse had to do with um, dysphoria-linked cognitive elaboration, a sort of effect of mood-dependent memory that people that have had episodes of depression can re-easily trigger views of the self, assumptions, negative thoughts, judgments, when they experience low levels, mild levels of sad mood. And some of the evidence for this came from uh, a study that I conducted where we treated people to remission who had had been depressed in the past, and then uh, asked them to come into the lab in order to um, engage in a mild mood induction. So we played some music for them, which was sort of uh, slow and lugubrious. It was actually, the, the piece of music was called Russia under the Mongolian yoke, which is sort of strange given what Randy said in her introduction and how it seems to be sort of the reverse of that right now. Uh, and it's from a, um, an opera, Alexander Nevsky. We shortened it so that it was 
uh, remastered to be played at half speed. And as people were play, uh, as people were listening to it, we also um, asked people to recall a sad time in their lives. So here you have a mood induction that reliably generates about um, five to ten minutes of sadness. It easily reverses. It's it's ethical, but during that window of sadness, we were able to um, assess people's attitudes and, and and beliefs about the self in two different conditions. When people came into the lab and they were feeling um, regular euphemic mood, and when they were then following the mood induction, um, feeling sad. And what we found here was that. All these people ostensibly looked like they were fine on clinical measures, on functional measures. But there were some people who, when they felt sad, endorsed a significantly greater number of negative self views, judgments, and assumptions. We used this functional attitude scale to measure this. And there were some people who just didn't change their endorsement from time one to time two at all. And then there were some people who, who changed their endorsement that actually endorsed fewer positive attitudes uh, or more positive attitudes. And what you find is that the people who, when they were feeling temporarily sad, increased their endorsement of negative judgments and assumptions had a significantly worse survival rate over 18 months following that initial visit to the lab. The folks who actually didn't change stayed the same from sad and normal mood, and the folks who endorsed significantly fewer of these uh, really didn't have any difference in relapse outcomes over time. So here we thought that there was a, a clue that pointed out this could be a trigger, the capacity of mild sad moods to reactivate a sort of state of mind that was reminiscent of how the person saw themselves when they were depressed. If we could help to insulate people in some ways from that effect, we might be able to develop a treatment that teaches people those skills directly. And so we, we took a look at some of the ways in which cognitive therapy tries to go about doing that. And uh, you know, just to illustrate some of our thinking, we took a look at the thought record, which in many ways I think is sort of um, like you know, the, the aspirin for mental health, it's used very widely in cognitive therapy. It's a fairly um, patient-friendly, easy to uh, implement uh, form of monitoring uh, negative affective incidents and asks the person to engage in a number of activities. Um, a lot of what the cognitive um, therapy thought record does is try to get people to evaluate their degree of belief in a negative thought. And at the end, you try to rearrange your degree of belief and maybe come up with a valid viewpoint. We saw it differently. We actually saw the thought record as having the potential to teach a number of skills that are very um, relevant to the practice of mindfulness. Skills that are very um, important, not just in um, modifying degree of belief, but in developing other capacities. So for example, in the first couple of columns of the thought record, people are asked to recall and to describe in, in, in fairly uh, good detail um, a situation and an emotion which was negative. Uh, people are then told about the concept of automaticity, automatic thinking, thoughts that just show up that may have a very negative tone. They are then asked to view their thoughts in a way as being provisional, not having a factual basis, but as hypotheses or ideas that people can evaluate. Um, and then to become curious to see if there's another way of um, going about uh, making sense of the initial situation. And so we saw these as relating to the development of the stress tolerance, awareness of automaticity, viewing thoughts as mental events, and developing curiosity in place of judgment. And these kinds of um, skills have been described in a number of other 
schools of therapy. They've also been described in people who have practiced meditation for periods of time. They've been called very many things, but they do come down to a sense of metacognitive capacity to relate to experience um, in a way that provides people with some measure of psychological distance. So we started to put two, two and two together and felt that if the metacognitive capacity provides people with a chance to develop a different relationship to their thinking, then maybe that could be very helpful for people who are likely to spiral downwards when they feel um, slight changes in mood, slight changes in sad, sadness or other affects. Providing them with some of that distance might actually be very effective in preventing relapse. And there was another piece to this story, which uh, I think happened sort of fortuitously, but was very helpful. Marshall Linehan was doing a sabbatical in Cambridge at the time and uh, became curious about why John and Mark were traveling to Toronto or why I was coming to see them in Cambridge. And we started to talk. Um, and she had actually, for the development of dialectical behavior therapy, um, gotten very interested in concepts like decentering and psychological distance. And she told uh, Mark and John, if you guys are really interested in learning about that, you should check out the work of John Kabat-Zinn. Why was that? Because she felt that uh, mindfulness meditation, and of course we know that Marsha has a history of practicing meditation. Mindfulness meditation is a way of directly training the centering. And so for us, this was like the third piece of the puzzle. We felt that we identified a um, target that is connected to vulnerability. We felt that we um, were able to identify a cognitive capacity that could allow people to engage differently with this vulnerability. And now, with what Marsha was doing by pointing us in a direction, and through our contact with John and some of the people uh, at the Center for Mindfulness, we felt that there was a framework for how to teach mindfulness in the context of looking after mood disorders that we thought was very important. And so his framework, um, the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction course, was something that we looked at and we, we modified in many ways to be relevant to people looking to prevent relapse and depression. And we had three essential hypotheses about MBCT. The first hypothesis was that mindfulness offers direct training in decentering. That's why we were interested in it. Decentering is anti-ruminative. So decentering can disrupt the kind of vulnerability that people have when they start to feel sad and then start to let the sadness work on what's wrong with them, why are they inadequate, what do they need to change about themselves, what do they need to fix. And then if they can reduce that, they should have a better outcome in terms of um, prophylaxis and prevention of depression than other folks. Now at that time, um, the prospect of teaching mindfulness meditation to people uh, with a mood disorder was seen as either uh, flaky, uh, career suicide, or um, just wrong-headed. And it's so funny these days because um, you know mindfulness is much less of a controversial topic. Um, I think that position has now been taken up by <clears throat> use of psychedelics for treating mood disorders. So mindfulness in a sense has become somewhat mainstream, at least in, um, in, 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 psych, in, in, being, in having a greater uh, degree of acceptance within the psychiatric community. And I think part of um, the case that I'd like to make is that the reason people were willing to listen is that we didn't make the argument based on anecdotes dotes or um, self-disclosure, we actually conducted a number of uh, rigorous um, randomized control trials to really test these hypotheses. And I will talk about those in a moment, but I, I just want to get to a couple of things inside MBCT that I think are very important. The first is that 
when we teach mindfulness in our programs, we're actually teaching two different types of attention. We're teaching a concentrative type of attention where people are focusing on a particular object. This could be the breath, this could be sensations in the feet if you're walking, this could be stretching sensations um, if you're doing mindful stretching. And you're looking at detecting when the mind wanders and when you bring it back to your chosen focus. We also teach um, a form of attention called open monitoring, where there's no explicit focus on objects like the breath or um, sensations in the feet. And there's um, a training in non, um, not evaluating or judging, not evaluating or judging experiences, just sort of viewing them as they arise one moment to the next. And both of these types of attention are very important because when we get into the program itself, we start to train people to pay attention in these different ways to objects that are very neutral. So for example, eating a raisin or scanning different parts of the body or engaging in mindful walking. But as you can see with time and with each successive week, the focus becomes less and less neutral until in the fourth, fifth, and um, continuing sessions of the program, people are starting to um, practice mindfulness of thoughts. And even in introducing an emotional difficulty into their mindfulness practice, things that in and of themselves um, may carry a lot of emotional consequences might pull the mind in all kinds of different directions, but the idea or the hope is that they will have learned how to approach these experiences much in the same way that they approached noticing sensations in their chest or noticing sensations in their shoulders or what it feels like to walk um, slowly and notice each footfall. In a sense, making the case that our experiences are on a continuum that we can get to know and observe and work with by becoming aware of them and then choosing what we want to do next rather than being pulled into a kind of automatic, reflexive, uh, reactive way of responding. Even when it comes to um, thinking deliberately about someone who insulted you or someone uh, who made you feel angry or having a loss come up for you that you need to, to process and deal with. And we've written uh, both training manual for therapists as well as um, workbooks for patients in our groups. And if you take a look at the MBCT session content, I would say the content divides itself in two different uh, epochs. In the first epoch, which are the first four sessions of MBCT, there is a big emphasis on awareness and mindfulness, just training people to be, become aware of where their attention is, harnessing their attention and using it to deal with emotional um, circumstances. The second half of the course starts to incorporate more of the cognitive therapy content. So even though there is a lot of emphasis on mindfulness and MBCT, it really sets up um, the program to enable people to consider the possibility of relapse or to consider the possibility of symptom worsening and then to engage in action in, in, in choices that are going to be adaptive. There is never the assumption in MBCT that awareness or insight in and of itself is going to be sufficient. In fact, you know, I often have People in our groups tell us that um, sometimes they can become aware of, of too much or sometimes they can become aware of how difficult it is for them. And that just sitting with that awareness um, can sometimes be counterproductive. Instead, what's required is that that awareness leads to some kind of action, some way of uh, looking after themselves that they can feel themselves choosing. And a lot of that is the focus 
um, of the latter sessions of NBCT. It's an eight-week program. Um, it ends after eight weeks. It's a group program so that it's um, more cost-effective, and we've, we've published some papers showing that there is a cost-effective element to offering it in a group. And it also is a program that can be uh, adapted for use in individual therapy because we also recognize that um, community level practitioners often aren't running groups. They're often seeing people uh, on a one-to-one -one basis. So just a, a couple of slides related to the evidence base of MBCT. Um, we ran our first study to essentially ask the question, is there a signal here? Does MBCT actually change outcomes related to relapse compared to treatment as usual? We didn't run very much in the way of studies that allowed us to look at mechanisms. Is it CBT part of it? Is it the mindfulness part of it? Because we felt like there was um, a fairly big risk that we were taking, we just wanted to see if uh, MBCT outperformed treatment as usual. And the early studies indicated that it did. More definitive studies are showing that um, MBCT in comparison to antidepressant pharmacotherapy, which is still really the standard of care for prophylaxis, both seem to perform similarly well. This is a paper that came out in The Lancet in 2015 with a total sample size of 424 patients. Uh, once again, all patients treated to remission with an antidepressant. And then um, the blue line are patients who were continued on the same antidepressant that got them well, follow-up of about two years. The red line are people who were treated to remission with an antidepressant, and then the antidepressant uh, was slowly tapered at their request, and they received eight sessions of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And so here we have a comparison of whether uh, people who come off their antidepressant medication um, are able to be protected on par with what an antidepressant uh, would give them if they're no longer taking their medicine, but they receive uh, cognitive MBCT instead. And the findings here are that um, there was no significant difference between these two treatments. The samples were adequately powered to detect, um, you know, differences. If anything, there may be a slight advantage for MBCT, but I'm not sure that that's a big thing. Um, essentially, it answers the question uh, that many people have who come to MBCT groups. Um, if for some reason I come off my antidepressant, will I be protected if I get MBCT. Now, that's a different question that some people ask, which some people sometimes sort of turn that upside down and say, can I come off my antidepressant by getting MBCT? And I think that that's a conversation I'm not very comfortable having with uh, a participant. And typically what I'll do is refer them back to their physician and say that that's really the place where that decision needs to be made. So coming to an MBCT group in order to come off your antidepressant, not so sure about that, not my call. But if I need to come off an antidepressant, so for example, I'm having very severe side effects or I'm uh, recently found that I'm pregnant and I don't necessarily want to be on an antidepressant for the first or the third trimester um, or the antidepressant has essentially stopped working for me. Um, there are a lot of reasons why people don't stay on antidepressants for years. And so someone like that um, might be um, encouraged to know that <clears throat> the, the degree of protection um, from participating and continuing with MBCT can be very, um, can be very effective. Another study that I wanted to tell you about was a study where we used um, a pill placebo to see what uh, benefits MBCT had. And so we treated people to remission once again. And uh, for one group, we discontinued their medication and gave them MBCT, eight sessions of MBCT. Then we followed them for a year and a half. 
Another group continued with their antidepressant for that same period of time. Another group came off their antidepressant and received the pill placebo. And, and what you see here is essentially taking some form of protection away from these people who are still at risk led to significantly poorer outcomes. The survival rates here are really low. Um, and not surprisingly, where you provide people with a pill and substitute a placebo, they're relapsing at about 78%. And survival here for people that had one or two forms of protection, either their antidepressant or MBCT, their survival here compared to um, survival of about 22%, survival here is about 70%, 68%. And so this gives us more confidence that the protection is, is a real thing. And then finally, a meta-analysis in JAMA uh, psychiatry showing that across nine studies with about 1,036 patients, um, there's about a 30% advantage to people in terms of relative hazard ratio um, who receive MBCT compared to not receiving MBCT. This could be treatment as usual. Um, this could be sort of a follow-up after having achieved remission. So the evidence base, I think, is quite strong across these different studies. and. And, and what that does really, I think, is it has the potential to redirect the field to ask specific kinds of questions. I think one of those questions is um, less about efficacy and more about mechanisms. Less about whether MBCT works and more about um, how does it work? What do we know about what's going on inside MBCT? And also, what do we know about what happens when people are no longer in MBCT and are tasked with having to look after themselves? And so one of the things that we did um, was use prevention treatments in a large RCT to allow us to study mechanisms of change. And so we compared, this is the first comparison of, of, of MBCT with CBT for prevention of depression. We modified the um, Fabrizio Fava's well, cognitive therapy with a well-being focus and provided that to people that had recovered from depression and randomized them to either receive the CBT with a well-being focus or MBCT. And just the sheer outcomes from uh, both of these treatments showed that there was no difference. The prophylaxis was really quite strong compared to maybe an expected relapse rate of about 55% or even 60%. Both of these groups were um, doing you know, quite well and uh, had relapse rates of only about 28%, oh, 20% and 21% for CBT. Um, so here we have two prevention treatments. They're both working. In fact, they're working pretty well. Um, what can we say about how people looked after themselves over two years? We followed them for two years afterwards. So once again, less interested about what goes on during the treatment, more interested in terms of what happens over two years when people are no longer in treatment. And because we're psychologists, we had people fill out a whole battery of tests and a lot of other self-report assessments and then we crunched all that data into a factor analysis and came up with three latent factors. So among, I think we had 33 self-report measures. The three latent factors that emerged of distinct um, psychological tendencies were um, one factor related to residual symptoms, not surprisingly, symptom scores, um, symptom burden. So. On this factor, you would expect uh, high loadings on the Hamilton depression scale, the Beck depression inventory, the um, Beck anxiety inventory, other measures of functional impairment. Another factor had high loadings on um, decentering, which was a combination of measures of attention and metacognitive awareness, um, 
And then the stress tolerance was another factor that had high loadings using measures of um, body awareness and um, the ability to describe events and um, low tendencies of experiential avoidance. So these three factors over two years, what seems to happen to them is that um, residual depressive symptoms stay pretty flat in terms of their trajectory. But there is an increase in growth of decentering, increase of growth in the stress tolerance over time. So that means that some people are continuing to develop metacognitive capacities. Some people are continuing to develop the stress tolerance and residual depressive symptoms are not so much growing as staying fairly steady. If you put each of these um, latent factors into a Cox regression to try to look and see whether people that had high or low levels of these capacities, how did they fare over the two years? What you find is that people who showed growth in decentering, the capacity to um, develop a metacognitive relationship to, the, to, to thoughts, to um, events in the mind, had a significantly lower rate of relapse than people who showed no growth in decentering. And so this, I think, is one of the um, important points of the initial series of hypotheses that led to the development of MBCT, which is decentering, if you're able to grow it, should protect you. And that's sort of what we're finding here. Two caveats, one caveat. There were no group effects that were relevant in this analysis. When you put group in, um, you do not get a significant in, uh, interaction term by group. In other words, decentering whether arrived at through MBCT or through CBT didn't matter, led to this increased uh, prophylaxis. So we didn't find um, really any differences in terms of any of the three latent factors. We didn't find that uh, CBT or MBCT uh, was different in terms of uh, residual symptoms, rate of growth of decentering, rate of growth of distress tolerance. And so, I mean, initially these findings I think were a little bit hard to um, swallow if you're committed to mindfulness. Why is that? Well, I think that a lot of the mindfulness literature um, sees mindfulness as a very direct way of training, uh, decentering the ability to observe and get some psychological distance on our thinking. And yet here we have cognitive therapy being able to generate similar amounts of um, benefits for patients without training people in mindfulness med meditation. So does this mean that um, mindfulness isn't that important or maybe it's the cognitive therapy elements in MBCT that are carrying the day? And we, we had to, I think, appreciate that that was a possibility. But then when you go back to some of the earlier um, writings of Tim Beck and others on cognitive therapy, there is a lot of um, emphasis on, on what he calls psychological distancing, which is essentially decentering as a way of helping people develop the ability to relate differently to their thoughts. So it's not completely missing in cognitive therapy. And I think when we started to see that, we saw the potential for therapies that look very different at a, on a topological level terms of what they actually do with the therapist in a session. They look really different, but maybe both are training to the same target. Both are training possibly to help people develop a way of relating to their, to their thoughts with psychological distance, with some awareness of impacts on the body. And one of the 
ways in which I think this is really borne out is uh, we wanted to we wanted to see whether um, <clears throat> the frequency of practice of either cognitive therapy skills or mindfulness skills made a difference in people staying well. Because maybe that's also one of the ways of understanding these findings that maybe people who practice mindfulness are told this needs to be a daily practice. You need to keep it up. You need to continue to work on it. And maybe in cognitive therapy, that's not so much a message that gets communicated. I think the message in cognitive therapy is a little bit more on, along the lines of um, if you start to feel down again, then you can pull out the therapy materials that you used and um, reacquaint yourself with the practices, reacquaint yourself with what was done and um, start using them again. And so maybe that's one way of understanding um, the, the differential uh, impacts of um, mindfulness messaging versus cognitive therapy messaging. But when we looked at that, it, it didn't really seem to fall out that way. The first thing that we noticed was that frequency of practice, whether it's mindfulness practices or cognitive therapy practices, how often people practiced or how long people practiced, both of these metrics, either time or frequency, actually were not correlated at all with relapse. 0 0.02. So that's kind of a head scratcher, right? Because um, there have been some other studies that have found correlations, although to be totally honest, some studies have and some studies haven't. And a recent review by, by Parsons and Becca Crane and others have found that if there are correlations between uh, practice frequency and clinical outcomes, they're very small. Effect sizes are, are like minute. And in looking at the data, I could definitely see that there were people who were practicing mindfulness or cognitive therapy quite a bit, and they still relapse. And then there were people who were practicing below the, the mean of what the groups were practicing, and they did well over two years. And I think there is one of these phenomena where the metrics of practice frequency and practice intensity can mean different things. For some people, they may ramp up their practices when their symptoms um, become aggravated. So one of the reasons they're practicing is not to prevent, but to um, ameliorate symptoms that have already surfaced and have already become difficult. Whereas other people might practice in order to prevent symptoms from occurring. And so they're doing it more preventively. This other group is doing it more palliatively. And so both of these, um, practice patterns are going to mess up any direct linear correlation. So that's, why I think, why it's hard for us to, um, to look at um, just the simple question of, hey, does it make sense to tell people to practice 45 minutes or 40 minutes a day when there's no correlation between how often you practice and relapse? But what we found, I think, was even more interesting. What we found was that Frequency of practice, yes, didn't have a huge impact on whether people relapsed or not. But decentering had a huge impact on whether people relapsed or not. It was correlated um, negatively with relapse. So the higher the uh, decentering score, and remember, this is decentering that was measured after both therapies had ended. This isn't during therapy, this is over two years. So people still growing their decentering skills were far less likely to relapse. And what's the biggest predictor of decentering? How do we get to decentering? How do we teach decentering? That comes from practice. So the story is, is really quite interesting. Um, and, and practice during the course, how to correlation of 0.3 with practice during the follow-up. So practice was kind of consistent, but practice during the follow-up 
was strongly related to the development of decentering, and the development of decentering was negatively related to development of real. So practice still makes a huge difference if it's done in a way that feeds the capacity for decentering. And so just to end, um, if we reconsider our initial hypotheses, we can say that mindfulness meditation offers direct training and decentering, and so does CBT, if it's taught in that way. And so now, maybe this requires us to take a step back. I've seen a lot of people teach mindfulness in different ways. Um, if you go on YouTube and you um, just type the search term three minute breathing space, <clears throat> you're gonna get a lot of hits for the three minute breathing space. You're also gonna get all kinds of different ways in which people teach it. And so what I've seen is people who teach it with music in the background, people who teach it with sounds like waterfall or water running, people teach it in a sort of dark room with a little blue light, uh, te people teach it in a way that encourages relaxation. And all of these ways are adequate and appropriate, but they're not really teaching relating to decentering. So I think we need to start to harness our teaching in a way that emphasizes decentering, maybe in place of other states of mind, for example, relaxation, for example, um, distraction, um, generating affective states or certain feelings. These are not the same as decentering. And, and maybe this is just particular to our population, but decentering seems to be especially important uh, for people with a mood disorder. And um, growth and decentering via CBT or mindfulness provides greater depression prophylaxis. And there is some emerging evidence that um, the neuroscience of depression risk following the pre uh, prevention treatments um, are compatible with this view because a lot of the neuroscience emphasizes that the decentering is linked to the capacity for interoceptive awareness, the ability to interpret signals from our bodies in a direct way rather than having them mediated through um, conceptual representations. Once again, if um, the mindfulness training that we're doing can be taught in this way, I think it'll have a big impact in the treatment of depression. Now, I don't know whether that translates into looking after people who more generally want to learn about mindfulness or not. They're not doing it to necessarily treat a clinical disorder, but at least within a narrow frame of the way in which I've described our work today, I think it is important. Um, and it's a message that I think you know needs a little bit of a, a wider broadcast. Thanks a lot for listening. I'd be happy to take any questions. That was wonderful. Thank you. Hmm. Um, I think we can open up for questions with uh, either people raising their hand and George can unmute them or you can type something <clears throat> in the chat box. And while people are pulling their thoughts together, I have a question for you. Yep. Um, there's some indications that MBCT may be less effective for single episode depression than it is for recurrent depression. And I've had some thoughts about why that might be, but I'd love to hear yours. Yeah, this is a, an ongoing topic, I think, since we ran our first RCTs, because we randomized people based on <clears throat> whether they had one or two episodes or three or more episodes. We were, we were looking and thinking that the folks with more recurrent disorder would be more receptive to MBCT, and, and they were. The folks who were um, presenting with only one or two episodes were less, um, showed, showed less benefit. They didn't get worse. They didn't really, the thing is they didn't separate from treatment as usual. So, um, I, 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 in talking to people, um, find that <clears throat> people that have only had one episode or so they, they don't experience or understand the notion of recurrence. And it's entirely possible that for them, um, they may not develop a recurrent, um, version of the disorder. 
And so the people who have a experienced two or three episodes, I think understand that they are at risk. And that risk can be important in motivating them to engage with the practices and to continue with the um, um, practices well beyond the point at which the treatment is over. Um, if you don't have a sense of, of being at risk and needing to do something to look after yourself, it's easy to fall back to externalized explanations for why you became depressed in the first place. Maybe you're going to too many raves and using ecstasy. Maybe you were with a bad partner and, and since that relationship ended, you're no longer at risk. Um, things like that, I think, can uh, whittle away <clears throat> motivation to engage in, um, in these practices. But I, I also have to say, Randy, I don't think we know definitively. I think these are just speculations that I have. I don't think there have been any large there have been a number of studies which have looked, I think there was one study by um, Nicola Geshwin from, from Amsterdam, where she looked at people with one or two or three or more episodes and found that MBCT was, was equally effective for them. So it's possible that, uh, you know, if more research comes out that way, we may need to change our framework. interesting about how much of this is related to the idea that we're buying into our own thoughts that we're believing our own storylines and i guess if the storyline is that this will never happen to me again mm. there's very little motivation for ongoing practice or the development of decentering um there's a, a couple questions in the chat box sure. um, leah is asked uh, could you please address the practice of gratitude as strengthening, decentering in light of research by Emmons, Fox, Huberman, et cetera. I think that there are so many ways of increasing decentering because essentially, you know, when you think of what decentering is, the term comes from Jean Piaget in developmental psychology. And what Piaget was talking about was in his stages of cognitive development, the development of the minds of children to young adults to adults, there's a point at which people's reality is viewed entirely from the perspective of self. And that adolescents or teenagers start to recognize that um, this self-centered perspective isn't the only way that you can understand how things work. And then they start to see things where their quote, the center, they're no longer at the center of things. They are able to develop theory of mind and understand how other people might react to something instead of only understanding it through how it affects them. Um, or they see other things happening that they don't have any control over. And so the self becomes uh, weakened, but in a good way because it allows other capacities to develop. I think practices like gratitude, if they have as their focus, and I think they do, the uh, capacity for people to let go of uh, strict ego boundaries or strict self boundaries or strict self identification, then that can do um, very much of the same type of thing that you can get from watching your thoughts come and go, watching emotions arise and fall, uh, watching sensations um, change in their intensity. And I, I, think, I think that that might be one a uh, place in which there are some parallels. I think MBCT doesn't make as explicit the focus on compassion or gratitude practices as a practice like um, compassion, uh, uh, mindfulness-based compassion. So, yeah. Um, but I think it's there. It's implicit, is my experience, both teaching and being a recipient of it. I mean, you get this a lot, and uh, <clears throat> I've, I've spoken with Chris Germer and others, um, and I think in the Mindful Self-Compassion program, they really are trying to directly develop and grow self-compassion. Um, we have it in MBCT, but it's not as easily seen because we don't lead with it. Instead, I would say that we 
um, infuse every practice that we do with compassion through the way that it's language, through the you know permission giving, through allowing the person to um, guide and set the uh, parameters of their own practice, and even inside. I think the basic message inside MBCT, which is implicit in a way, is that stopping your mind and paying attention to your experience is a very compassionate thing to do because there's a fundamental way in which you're honoring yourself differently from the contingencies your mind might be suggesting are required for you um, to connect with yourself. Now, it's, 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 it's really not a main focus around self-compassion, although we do have a self-compassion practice for our um, half-day retreat between session six and seven. But that's just one of the differences between us two programs. Rael uh, is here, whom I believe you know, he trained with yeah. you. Um, and he said, uh, thank you, Zendel, wonderful talk. Uh, Cresswell and colleagues have published a number of studies in the last few years showing that uh, explicit inclusion of acceptance instructions in the process of mindfulness training leads to dramatically better outcomes on stress and biological markers of inflammation. Do you have a sense of the relationship between the possible centrality of acceptance to mindfulness benefits and the meditating mechanism of decentering that you're proposing here today? Yeah, you know, I think this is a great question. I also think it's like the 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 hub for the next decade of what we need to unpack in mindfulness. First of all, the term acceptance is really misleading and we, we, we dropped it in our move from the first edition to the second edition of NBCT, of the manual. Why did we drop it? When you communicate to patients that are experiencing something difficult, something uh, unpleasant, that uh, they need to work with it to maybe become more accepting or can they introduce acceptance into that sometimes and and not just um infrequently but very often people can see that as akin to resignation or giving up or just feeling powerless in, in the face of it we've replaced the term acceptance with allowing and letting be so part of what you're allowing is the experience to be here in the mind or in an attentional field. And in allowing it, you can continue to engage with it. Very often when people think about acceptance, they stop their engagement with it. Acceptance viewed as allowing and letting be also has a number of benefits. It can train distress tolerance. And it can also train exposure to unpleasant events, almost like in a behavioral sense. But the difference here is that the allowing and letting be occurs on top of a platform of the body being settled and decentering, which allows this choice to be made in the face of negative affect. So in a sense, it, it sort of comes together because the work of mindfulness in these later sessions of MBCT, and I think in any context psychotherapeutically, is to prepare people through settling the body and the mind to then approach and allow negative affect or negative experiences to be in the mind and to be worked with in this way. So how that exactly I think happens is, is really an important thing to tease apart. And in David Cresswell's work, the stance on negative experiences that are reflected in the word acceptance or allowing or letting be or approach as opposed to avoid, I think activate different physiological systems. And that might be part of it. One of the things I, I struggled with at the beginning of learning MVCT was this integration of mindfulness, which is basically an acceptance, allowing, letting go model mm -hmm. with cognitive therapy, which is a change model. If you don't like right. to let's change them. And yeah. interesting how well they've meshed together in MVCT because it shifts, I think, that 
focus of, of acceptance from being a passive resigned quality to being more of, well, here's where I'm at now and what can I do to help myself? Mm -hmm. A proactive uh, stance rather than a resigned passive stance. Another question um, said, it's a wonderful talk, thank you. Can you discuss any condition between decentering and social comparison given the huge power of social comparison uh, via social media? Um, any, can you discuss any condition, meaning what do you think Maya means by condition? I'm not sure. Uh, do you want to uh, unmute and, and speak up, Maya? Hello. Hi, Maya. Hi. First of all, thank you for a wonderful talk. Oh, you're welcome. I know that was a really cryptic question because I was listening to Ryle's question at the same yeah. time. <laughs> Um, so what I was trying to get at is, you know, given that we're, you know, seeing the effects of all of the social comparison that especially young people are subject to, yeah. you know, you could sort of see um, decentering in a sense of, of, I mean, you could, in a way, you can interpret it as being more sensitive to that social comparison because it's stepping away from yourself, but it's also being more aware of the outside. So that's a simple way of saying it. And what I'm really asking more deeply is, you know, what's a good way to deal with it? What's a good way to to use what you have told us to deal with the effects of, of social unavoidable social comparison. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I, I, I love your question. And so when I think about decentering, I'm actually thinking, this could be an overstatement, so take it with a grain of salt. I'm actually step, thinking about stepping out of thinking altogether. And social comparison is still a form of thinking. Mm -hmm. And if you have a place into which you can step, Maybe that's your body. Maybe that's noticing an urge to continue to check your phone. Maybe that's noticing thoughts about you're missing something. The decentering allows you to see all of this going on. And then you can make a choice about, you know, do I want to put my phone down or do I want to say for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to go, um, <clears throat> I'm going to go all out, see everything on Twitter on Instagram, everything that's out there. That's really where the decentering, I think, can come in. That it, it provides you with the possibility of stepping back away from thinking into a place where you can watch and then make some decisions. Um, I think continuing to engage with thinking um, without an intention to say that, you know, that's what I want to continue to do is still sort of being caught up in that loop a little bit. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks for your question. One of my favorite quotes is uh, from John Kabat-Zinn, who said, uh, all thoughts are just thoughts, even the ones that tell you they're not. Right. Uh, Rael has another question. He said, you mentioned the fact that mindfulness has lost its status as outside the mainstream of psychiatric treatment. In some ways, psychedelics have replaced mindfulness at this time. You also mentioned some important connection between changes in self-perception and the benefits of decentering through mindfulness training. Similarly, there are dramatic effects on self-perception occasioned by the use of psychedelics. What are your thoughts on the potential for using psychedelics as an adjunct for increasing the benefits of mindfulness practice? Yeah, this is a crazy question because I find myself, I mean, it's a great question, but it, it leads to a crazy answer. Um, so I find myself like I'm now the person who 20 years ago would say to me, you're crazy if you think you're going to teach the press patients how to meditate. Like, why would you ever do that? And so now I'm the kind of person that says to like, you know, talk to graduate students that are like super excited about psychedelics. And I say to them, you're crazy. Why do you want to do this with like the press patients? So in some ways I've either become like conservative or a reactionary or I don't know what, but having said that, there are a lot of there are a lot of interesting parallels, and in fact, there are a couple of studies that I've seen where I think this was a study in maybe in Denmark where they went to um, a meditation retreat, and they they had a number of people do psilocybin on this meditation retreat, and then they gave them a number of questionnaires. They gave them a decentering scale and they gave them the, an ego dissolution scale, and what they found was that meditation in and of itself 
led to reports of ego dissolution and some degree of decentering. But the people who were meditating and also had the psilocybin reported much greater changes in ego dissolution. And so, you know, you're starting to see some parallels maybe um, with some of the psychedelics suggesting that they are sort of like the royal road to decentering. Never mind practicing mindfulness for like three years in the morning and hoping that you get into some place where you can reliably um, access these different states of mind. I think one of the promises, and it, it could be hype as well, is that with psychedelics, like you're getting uh, a massive experience uh, related to decentering and just seeing the world from other perspectives where many of your assumptions about how things work, what colors are, what... Um, what edges and boundaries and borders are uh, just sort of get dissolved. And so maybe that can lead to you questioning certain assumptions that you've held in a very rigid way. So there are connections. I still think it's very early. I also think there's a lot of hype in the field because there's also a lot of interest in uh, monetizing uh, the use of these therapies. So you have to be careful, but I think there are some possible overlaps. I would, I would, uh, I don't know a lot about this topic. It's something that the folks at CMS have been discussing recently, and it, mm. it interests me greatly. But one thought is that the psychedelic would be equivalent of antidepressant medications, and that when you stop taking them, they stop working. And so it would be interesting to see some research on long-term follow-up of benefits after the psychedelics wear off and see if they're retained over the long term. I don't know if that's taken place yet. Rail may know. Um, but you, I can see the parallel between that and antidepressants. Yeah. I, I think the thing to add to, to this conversation is that um, <clears throat> the psychedelics in and of themselves do what they do but the way in which they can be maximized for psychotherapy is usually presented as having a therapist prepare the person, guide the person during the trip, and then work with the person to consolidate what they got out of the trip. So it's not just sort of like a recreational um, use, but the idea is that with that in place, um, you should have better outcomes. I, and I don't know if that's if that's been tested or, or examined because a lot of these studies don't necessarily have that um, psychotherapy adjunctive support available. So that would be the equivalent of the skills training pieces of MBCT and CBT. Of yeah. being able to take something with you that you can then subsequently use later. Yeah, and DBT also. Yeah. Man, just wanted to share a personal story when you mentioned about mindfulness is no longer alternative. Um, about 12, maybe 13 years ago, I called uh, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. I called the program officer to discuss a research project I was planning. And the program officer listened to my pitch, which was using mindfulness as the intervention, and then said, we no longer consider mindfulness alternative, and sent me back to NIMH because it was mental health. Wow. And that, that really stuck with me that NICAM didn't think that mindfulness was alternative at that point. So any other questions? I think it's been a wonderful discussion. I know I have a bunch more, but um, uh, anybody in our, let's see, am I missing one? Wait, something, uh, here we go. Emily says, I did miss one, apologies. Uh, do you know if there's any evidence that decentering is a crucial factor in the efficacy of MBCT slash CBT on affective disorders other than depression relapse, such as anxiety and PTSD? Apologies, Emily, for missing yeah. that question. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a really good question. Um, I, I, I think that decentering is one of these transdiagnostic variables that is going to likely show up in 
um, successful therapeutic um, impacts in depression and anxiety, and PTSD and elsewhere, because it correlates negatively with the neuroticism on the neo. Mm -hmm. And it's one of these um, abilities that if people can develop some of that, then they have a different relationship to their symptoms. It doesn't always mean that their symptoms will go away, but it means that they might be able to um, have a better scope of functioning with some symptoms that are there. And eventually it's possible that their symptoms might change as well. So I do see this more of a trans theoretical. And I think one of my slides where you had like Sigmund Freud, Tim Beck and uh, the Dalai Lama, I, I think it's something that a lot of therapies aim for. They use different words to, um, to try to describe it, but it is, um, it, it is, I think, very, very trans theoretical. It may be a trans diagnostic as well in some ways. True. True. If we frame depression as rumination on the past and anxiety as ruminating on the future, mm. it's only the direction of time that's different. Yeah. But, and it certainly creates different emotional responses to the thoughts, but moving into that broader perspective of metacognitive awareness that the thoughts in the past and the thoughts in the future are still just thoughts. Uh, Maybe a reason why it's that seems to be as, as effective for anxiety as it is for depression. Okay, Raelle has one more. And again, I'm sorry, Emily, and I'm glad I found your question. Um, Raelle says, regarding the clinical utility of mindfulness, can you speak about which participants are most likely and least likely to benefit from mindfulness interventions? This seems to be an area where we still have very incomplete knowledge base. Why do some people benefit so much and some benefit so little? Yeah, I mean, this is an ongoing um, query, uh, you know, in many ways. Um, I, I, I think that some of the exclusions that I'm still endorsing can tell us a little bit about this here. So for example, we endorse exclusions into MBCT if someone has borderline personality disorder. Um, and we also exclude people if they've had a history of trauma and haven't had any psychological work to develop a narrative around that trauma. Now, trauma is so prevalent these days that you know you need to understand you know why that would be the case. Both for borderline personality disorder and for people with trauma, the mindfulness practices in MBCT have as one of their intentions um, an opening and an approach towards chaotic experiences with the possibility that some stability of mind can allow people to know these experiences in a different way. For people with borderline personality disorder, approach and contact with chaotic experiences is not a great idea. If you think of what DBT does with mindfulness, they limit their mindfulness practices to five minutes. The capacity for patients with BPD to tolerate a lot um, in that sort of way um, is, is not a great idea. If someone has trauma symptoms and they don't understand uh, how that may be manifest in the body, then if they're doing a body scan or if they're sitting and um, they all of a sudden have a flashback and they have an intense bodily reaction. Um, they may not know what's happening to them. It might be very, likely will be very overwhelming. And so there's a mismatch because the therapist in an MBCT group doesn't really have the time to go over and spend, you know, 15 or 20 minutes unpacking that with somebody. They have to really also look after the other people in the group. So a person going through that wouldn't also get the kind of care that they might need. Now, if they've already had a psychological therapy where they've been able to develop a narrative and they know that, you know, my, my racing heart or tension uh, in my shoulders or, or some kind of hypervigilance um, is just a flashback or um, a reanimation of the trauma, they might be able to tolerate that or do things to open their eyes or practice in a way that can allow them to stay there. 
So I'd say those are the two things that I understand about um, people. And I think the other thing is making sure, and this is a difficult one, that people who come into these groups are not in the midst of a full-blown episode of depression, because I think that that can shut down some of the executive control networks in the brain yeah. that would support the kind of concentration, attention, pain abilities that you kind of need uh, week over week in an MVCT group. Also increases the self-blame when they're not able to pay attention. And exactly, and that only makes things worse. I've done some work with uh, trauma, with a women's trauma group. We've brought in small pieces of mindfulness, mm -hmm. uh, like DBT, in, in five-minute, three-minute intervals. And yeah. we tend to stay away from body practices because those can be very triggering for uh, somebody with trauma. Yeah, you know, and then, then the other thing I, I could add is also if you're going to modify it for population, sometimes it's better to start with movement practices than with the sedentary sitting practices. People can feel a little bit more engaged and it could be a little bit less frightening for them to sit with their minds. And when you're moving and walking, there's a way in which that can be a little bit more of a, a tolerable ask. Yeah, using practices even like soles of the feet practice. Yeah. Can be grounding activities and stabilizing type activities. So, ah, let's see. Uh, what else do we have? Yeah, why some people benefit so much and some so little seems to be a nice area for future research. Mm -hmm. um, Rail suggested possibly related to specific personality disorders and or tendencies to towards passivity as the dominating, the depressive picture. That could interact with symptom burden too. Yeah, I mean, I, I see passivity as almost the diametric opposite of acceptance, um, where acceptance is this active engagement with one's life. Um, another question for me, um, there's been a lot of issues with self-report in mindfulness studies. And you're familiar with the foggy mirror problem. Mm -hmm. More advanced practitioners are often reporting less mindfulness, primarily because they're more aware of how often they're not mindful. Um, what are your thoughts about that and how you could strengthen those measures? Well, we don't have a behavioral measure of mindfulness. Um, Richie mm -hmm. Davidson had one at one point, which had to do with the amount of time, I mean, he published on one amount of time people notice mind wandering uh, or that they get interrupted during a sitting meditation. But I think a lot of, or you know, another person said like embed um, a heat sensor in someone's meditation cushion and you'll see how often they actually sit. And, you know, that's the only thing worth counting or knowing about. I think it's really different, be, difficult because I think that when it comes to numbers, numbers can mean two different things. If you have people who report a decrease on a depression symptom measure, that could mean that their symptoms have decreased and that they're doing well. If you have someone who doesn't report um, as much of a decrease, it doesn't mean that they're not doing well. It's possible that they're better able to tolerate some of their symptoms and that they're still um, functional. So, with, you know, but, but if you're measuring mindfulness based on functional outcomes, those functional outcomes can be dependent on all kinds of things, including or not including how mindful they are. It's, it's, a, it's a tricky area. Um, I think you need convergent validity and actually, you know, the, the one really interesting input is to include an observer report of um, how mindful or, or how aware another person is as part of the overall assessment. Now, there have been reaction time tests. There have been biomarkers. The imaging yeah. studies on mindfulness are fascinating, both functionally and structurally, of what's happening in the brain. Um, but most studies use self-report measures because they're cheaper and easier. Yeah. So, um, okay. Uh, let's see. 
Deborah has asked, please send contact information. Is that for Zendel, Deborah? Do you want to unmute and speak up? Happy to send you mine, but I think you already have it. I'll put my, my email in the, in the text. Okay. Thank you, Zendel. I think we're about out of time here. And I think this has been a wonderful talk and a wonderful dialogue. And I thank you very much for joining us for this and wish you all the well. Thanks very much. It was a pleasure to interact and, and speak to you. And um, I hope that someday we can do this in person. That would be fun. It would, yeah. And, uh, you know, you've been down to UCSD and you've been over on the west side. So it's time for you to come visit USC. All right. Thanks for inviting me. Take care, everyone.